privilege to be before you once again. Glad to have each of you in attendance this morning. Not just here, but those who might be viewing across the interwebs. If you would, be turning to the book of 1 Kings. We'll be spending quite a bit of time in that book. But before we get there, I would like to introduce the character I'd like for us to study this morning. And the account that is noteworthy for this lesson is found in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. This passage depicts an account of Jesus and his transfiguration. In this account, Jesus is joined with both Moses and Elijah. Later, Jesus would be exalted by the Father, God the Father. But it would also call to our minds some questions. One of them being, out of all the Old Testament prophets, why was Elijah there with Moses and Jesus? Now, some have considered Elijah the grandest or greatest character Israel has produced with respect to a prophet. And others have considered him the mightiest and most outstanding of those Old Testament prophets. Yet I think one thing that we always overlook, and it's very easy to do, is James chapter 5 verse 17, where it says that Elijah was a man subject to passions as we are. You see, the people we read about in the Bible aren't just mythical people that have been thought up. They're men and women just like we are. They didn't have the same luxuries as we do. They didn't have the same cultures that we do, but they did basically the same thing. They thought the same ways, and they had cares and concerns just like we do today. Elijah had the same issues to deal with, but I think we, like I said, I think we kind of don't think about those things whenever we read the Bible. But here, Elijah was a mere mortal man and subject to the same weaknesses that we are, same temptations, trials, just as all other men. Now with these things in mind, how did such a man become such a great prophet of God? What lessons then can we glean from his life? How can this prophet aid us in our service to God today? Well, let us consider Elijah the man. Let's look at his name. The name Elijah means Yahweh is God. Now the New Testament offer, often renders Elijah as Elias. His origin, we're first introduced to Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. However, there is no mention of his parents, his birth, nor even his prophetic call. This is a very similar way of introduction that we, we see from Melchizedek. Now, Elijah is given the title of Tishbite, and he is labeled as one of the inhabitants of Gilead. We might note his appearance. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. There he's depicted as a very hairy man. And it's noteworthy of the, thing, the things that he was wearing. It's said that he, was, he wore a leather belt or a girdle about his waist. Now, these characteristics distinguished him from those around him. There might have been hairy people around him, but he was more hairy. Now, Jews of the day 
typically wore comfortable clothes. That makes sense. They would often wear soft linen or cotton girdles or belts. And they would wear one or two linen shirts or gowns. And these would be covered by a large shawl. Yet when you look at Elijah, he had none of those things. He had a leather belt. And his cape or mantle was that of sheepskin. Some sort of animal skin. Thus his description would fall very well in one of the categories mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37. His appearance is also seen in the life of John the baptizer. This man, the forerunner of Christ, was labeled as Elijah. Matthew chapter 3 verse 4. Mark chapter 1 verse 6. And Jesus makes the, the link here in Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. Now, even for his day, Elijah would have been labeled as a strange individual. Yet he remains a quite remarkable man, certainly worthy of our consideration. Thus we consider Elijah and his ministry. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, we see his proclamation of a drought for Israel. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not, uh, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. We must note the wickedness that King Ahab and Jezebel were involved in. 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 29 through 33. And because of this wickedness, God through Elijah pronounces a drought upon Israel. Through this time of drought, we will see that God is taking special care of Elijah. God sent him to the book Cherith. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2 through 7. And throughout these, these verses, we see that he would be taken care of by a widow of Zarephath. There we'd see a miracle regarding the bin of flour and the jar of oil, verses 8 through 16. And even the raising of this widow's son, in verses 17 through 24. This was one way God took care of Elijah. Now later on, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, God called Elijah to appear before Ahab once again. And this meeting was arranged by the governor of his house, that is Ahab's house, Obadiah. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 3 through 16. And eventually... Verses 17 and 18 of that chapter, Elijah would indeed meet with Ahab. The Bible there reads, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Elijah was falsely accused of troubling Israel. However, he correctly puts the charge back on Ahab. This would prompt Elijah's challenge of the prophets to meet on Mount Carmel. Elijah challenges the false prophets of Israel, verses 19 and 20 of 1 Kings chapter 18. This includes the 450 prophets of Baal, as well as the 400 prophets of Asherah, also referred to as prophets of the grove. Now each of these prophets were supported by Queen Jezebel. Now this challenge is as follows, verses 19 and 21. Now therefore sin, and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves, four hundred. 
which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab said unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long shalt ye halt between two, two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. If Jehovah is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Elijah was met with silence, much like in discussions today with people. They want to try to bully and push their ideals, but when you stand up to them, they either lash out in violence or they stand silent. Now we see in verses 22 and through 24 the test that would be put forth for all these prophets says, Then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the other people answered and said, It is well spoken. So we see that both parties agree to build an altar to their respective God or gods. And an answer of fire would determine the genuine deity. Now, Elijah allows these false prophets to go first in this test. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 25 through 29. There it says, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, <coughs> Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. And they cried aloud, and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. You see, these prophets, these false prophets, failed in receiving an answer from Baal. This then prompted taunting from Elijah. Ultimately, it brought about his turn calling upon Jehovah God. Now in the following verses, beginning in verse 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. 
And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. Verse 35, And the water ran round about the altar, and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. This is quite a victory for Elijah. His obedience to God was able to show forth God Almighty and His power. Now we see in verse 40 that the false prophets were put to death. Elijah then prays for rain. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 through 46, thus the drought with Israel concludes. But then we see Elijah's flight for safety. Throughout the entire chapter of 1 Kings chapter 9, or 1 Kings 19, beginning there, we see that Queen Jezebel threatens to murder Elijah. And accordingly, he flees for his life to Beersheba. Due to these events, Elijah wishes for his own death there in verse 4. Now as he's sleeping, he is charged with traveling to Mount Horeb. And then an angel wakes him up and provides meal for him, food and drink, verses 5 and 7. And then we see in verse 8 that he has restri- received enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights. Now even after everything that we've just read, even the response of Israel, we find that Elijah is discouraged. Yet we see God's response. Elijah felt lost, even in spite of all of his, all of his accomplishments. And he tells God this in verses 9, 10, and 14. But God's response is given in verses 11, 12, and then 15 through 17. Eventually, God would show his power to Elijah. And he points out to him that this is no time to fret. However, it is time to act. Similar situation with Joshua. Stop crying, get up, and do God's will. Thus, God gives him a new list of of duties to accomplish. We see that Elijah is to anoint Hazael as king of Syria, as well as anointing Jehu over Israel as king, and then to anoint Elisha as prophet to take his place. And then serving to encourage Elijah, God shows that Elijah is not alone. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. He there says, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. In that chapter, as it concludes, we see that Elijah was able to make Elisha his servant and eventually follow in his stead. As Elijah continues his ministry, we see that he would again rebuke Ahab and then also Ahaziah. Ahab gets rebuked because of the transaction with Naboth. Jezebel has Naboth murdered so that Ahab could take his vineyard. 1 Kings chapter 21 verses 1 through 16. Due to this couple's wickedness, Elijah then pronounces their death. 
Their shameful deaths are predicted in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 17 through 26. Yet we see that Ahab repents and thus delays his sentence, verses 27 through 29. Then in 2 Kings chapter 1, the first eight verses, we see here that Elijah rebukes Ahaziah. This injured son of Ahab, rather than praying to God, sends an inquiry to Beelzebub. And Elijah is discharged to send those messengers back. Thus, a rebuke and prophecy of death is then sent to Ahaziah. We see in this account that there are three companies of soldiers sent to pull Elijah to the king. In verses 9 through 12, we see that two of these companies were consumed by fire from heaven. Yet Elijah is told to return with the third company, verses 13 through 15. This leads Elijah, speaking directly to Ahaziah in verses 16 and 17, foretelling his death due to his wickedness. And then later on we would see the account of Elijah being translated, not having to undergo death, but to be taken away. Now as we consider the ministry and life of Elijah, what message does his life hold for us today? We must note, for it is obviously there, the power of prayer. Returning to James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, the Bible there reads, Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, or as we said, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave, gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. So the drought that was upon Israel lasted for three and a half years. But it was as a result of Elijah's prayer. And in like manner, that drought ended with Elijah's prayer. This should serve to encourage us not only to pray for one another, but to show the great value of of the prayer which is offered by the righteous. Do we believe in the power of prayer? We should. After all, God is the one who hears our prayer. Psalm 65, verses 1 and 2. Jesus taught there is power in prayer. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Even the Apostle John shows the value in praying to God according to his will. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Elijah's account shows us the providence of God. Throughout the many hardships that Elijah was met with, God provided for him. We see that by the brook Cherith, that ravens brought Elijah food. Then we see that the widow there of Zarephath, Zarephath provided for his daily needs. And then later on in his journey to Mount Horeb, the angel provided his needs, both food and drink. Do we believe in this providential care of God? After all, Jesus our Savior promised such. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 34. And Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. This was further taught by the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Then we see the need for commitment. You look around today and there are very few people that are committed, especially to good things. But Elijah was a committed prophet. He took a stand for the Lord against the adversaries of God. 
1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Here he is, one man, no doubt labeled a vagabond, probably other foul terms, standing before the king of Israel and then there to condemn him. But Elijah did it anyway. Why? Because God said so. And the important point there too, the Lord has said this, whom before I stand. He was in front of the king Ahab. But he said, I stand before God. Now Elijah also called the whole of Israel to choose to serve Jehovah God. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Because it was not just those prophets. It was the whole host of Israel that was able to hear and see this test. Are we willing today to make similar commitments? To choose to serve the right master? Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. To serve the one, the only one, who has the power to remove our sins. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. To serve the Father instead of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And then to serve God with a burning zeal. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And then we note something that I think each and every one of us has experienced, probably to different levels, but that is the challenges of discouragement. Not everything is sunshine and rainbows, but it's how we deal with those difficult situations that help us push forward. We see that Elijah fell victim to discouragement and even depression. He wanted his life to end. He wanted to die. He thought he failed God. He thought he failed God because very few people actually listened to his message. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. As being zealous for God, he assumed that no one listened. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14. Yet God's response was to put him back to work, remain in service to Jehovah. And God showed that Elijah was indeed wrong. 1 Kings 19, verses 15 through 18. I know we've all gotten discouraged and depressed to one extent or another. I know that I certainly have. Even the apostles of Jesus Christ were not immune to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. Yet we see that God provides comfort for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, as well as chapter 7, verse 6. The solution remains the same. You are not alone. Even if no other person stands with you, God is with you. Or really, rather, you're with God. And secondly, remain in service to the Lord. Now, obviously, that sounds simple. And it is a simple statement. But if you're so busy doing God's work, you're not going to be having time to mope around and feel sorry for yourself and wonder whether or not you did a good job. Because it is not our responsibility to make people obey God's word. It is, however, our responsibility to individually obey God's word and then present it to others. We see also from the life of Elijah the consequence of sin. Consequences of sin in his account are shown to be quite terrible. We saw the drought on Israel, three and a half years with no rain. We go three months in Texas without rain and we think the world's over. Now, there is crop damage that goes along with that, but three and a half years? All because the people were wicked. And Ahab and Jezebel were wicked. And then the judgment upon the prophets of Baal and the groves. 
All 850 of those prophets were put to death. Why? Because they were wicked before God. And then eventually the deaths of both Ahab and Jezebel. The results? Consequences of sin. Do we today appreciate the severity of sin? Do we ever think about the physical toll that sin can and does oftentimes take in our lives? Not only the absence of God's providential care for us, but also the negative effects that immorality and worldliness brings. But then do we realize the spiritual toll that will ultimately be experienced in this life as well as the next? You see, the consequences of sin in this life We're still separated from God. Thus, we lose the benefits that come from being his child and faithful service. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Yet if we die in that condition, we will be eternally lost, eternally separated from our creator. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Then we note the hope for the righteous. The life of Elijah illustrates the hope for all those who persevere. We see that Elijah was translated to heaven. Death had no power over him. And then we see him appearing in glory on the mount where Jesus was transfigured. Luke chapter 9 verses 28 through 32. What hope do we then have if we persevere to the end? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 54, it says the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible. And all those faithful will receive rest and be glorified. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. Now this morning we've considered the life of Elijah the Tishbite and then the lessons that we can learn from him. Now we must realize that these things were written for our learning. Romans 15, 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. They're there not just to take up space, but for our learning, for our growing, for our hope. Now, the account of Elijah, the great prophet, teaches us many lessons. This morning, we've considered the power of prayer, providence of God, the challenges of discouragement, broaden more broad than that, but the challenges of life, the consequences of sin, and the hope for the righteous. Now, just as Elijah consumed the soldiers with fire from heaven, The day will come when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in them and in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Are you prepared for that day? Because that sort of day is coming. If not, hear again the words of Elijah, that great prophet. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. How long halt ye between two opinions? If Jehovah be God, follow him. But if Baal, and I would insert secularism, then follow him. Follow that. Each and every one of us must make a choice. And it comes down to these two options. If you're not a Christian today, why not become one? 
Begin and grow your faith in Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ before others. And finally, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. From that point forward, you're qualified to become a child of God. The Lord will add you to His church. And you're saved from that point forward. Now, the choice from that point forward is yours whether or not you remain faithful. If the Lord is God, follow Him. If the world be God, follow it. And that is a choice we all must make every day of our lives. Now, as we become more faithful to God, we study. We're around people who want to be godly. That is, our brothers and sisters in Christ. That decision becomes easier and easier, I would say. But we're still susceptible to sin. Now, if as a child of God you have allowed sin into your life, why not be restored through repentance and prayer and confess your faults one to another? If either of these needs apply to you, please make it known as together we stand and sing.